Hitler's assumption of absolute power in February 1933 was cause for mixed reactions among German citizens. Many saw it as a time of patriotic rebirth, a new spirit of nationalism. But for many of the country's 500,000 Jews, it was a time of apprehension, a foreboding sense of trouble. Within the space of five years from his assumption of power, Hitler publicly and clearly set the stage for the destruction of Germany's Jewish community, as well as that of all of Europe's Jews. But in the early years of his rule, most Germans, including the largely assimilated Jewish population, did not take seriously that his prophecy of a Germany and a Europe without Jews would come to pass. The first indication, however, came in April 1933, when Hitler declared a national boycott against Jewish businesses, an action which was brutally enforced by his growing legion of Nazi thugs. And in May 1935, the Nuremberg racial laws legally separated German Jews from their neighbors and friends. The danger became still clearer in November 1938, when hundreds of Jewish-owned shops, homes, and synagogues were attacked by Nazis and their followers in a pogrom which was to become known as Kristallnacht, the Night of the Broken Glass. By 1939, the Jews of Germany had lost their legal right to any semblance of a normal life, and within a few years they were to lose as well the right to a normal death. By 1939, close to 250,000 Jews had fled to whatever country would accept them. Some, however, as the passengers on the German liner St. Louis, who were denied entry into America, were forced to return to Europe, where many were later to become victims of the Holocaust. The remaining German Jews organized their own self-help services, struggling to maintain their dignity and sense of community in the midst of their despair. And as the first transports of German Jews began to leave in September 1941 from Berlin to Nazi death camps in Poland, some of the remaining Jews tried to escape by turning to neighbors, friends, and even total strangers to plead for a place to hide, if not for themselves, at least for their infants and children. And some Germans did find it possible to help. Who were these people? Why did they risk their lives to save Jewish fugitives at a time when they, like so many others, could have remained indifferent or even hostile? Let us meet some of these rescuers and learn more about what they actually did and why. Herbert Schröter was a soldier on the Russian front. In early February 1944, after two years of frontline duty, he returned on a short leave to his parents' home on the outskirts of Berlin. And, uh, I came home with my gun and bag and rang the bell to my house. My mother opened the garden door. We had a garden in front of our house. And she was surprised and happy to see me coming back home alive. Then, after entering the house, she told me that a lot had changed in the past two years, for they were not alone in the house. She told me there were six more people, in addition to my parents, who had taken refuge there. Then she explained to me that they were Jews. Mr. and Mrs. Reich, with their child, and Mr. and Mrs. Sachs, with her mother, who died in the house later in the war. I wasn't that surprised about six additional people living with them. What was more surprising was the fact that my parents were hiding Jews. That was certainly risky for them. My mother told me that after almost two years of their activity, they could have aroused suspicion, but no one had as yet reported them to the authorities. It is true, however, 
that they had received several postcards or warnings. There was one postcard that read, clean your eyes from foreign objects or they run the risk of going blind. It was a hidden warning. You can interpret it as that. My parents, of course, were frightened, but they didn't react by throwing out the hidden people. But from that day on, they took even greater precautionary measures. I saw the postcard and I asked a lot of questions, but many of them my parents couldn't answer themselves. In spite of their concerns, my father went to work each morning and my mother stayed at home and cooked for the people or they did it themselves when my mother brought them food. But apart from that, after the first of those two years, they lived quite a normal life. The Quakers were outspoken critics of National Socialism. At the same time, this religious movement was a beacon of hope for Jews seeking refuge. Ilse and Gerhard Schwerensky were committed Quakers living in Berlin. Roswitha Baudisch, their daughter, remembers this time. My father was considered half Jewish as his father was Jewish. For that reason, he was a committed anti-Nazi. My parents became members of the Communist Party very early in order to put up resistance to National Socialism. But shortly after they joined the party, they realized that they felt out of place and they were soon excluded because of inadequate commitment. From 1933 on, my parents belonged to the Quakers, who supported them actively, since my father couldn't get permission to work. But the Quakers also helped them in a moral, ethical and religious sense. One day in early 1943, two young Jewish women, Lotti Katz and Lorraine Jacobi, who feared immediate deportation, came to the Schwersensky's door. As my parents had earlier mentioned at a Quaker meeting, their willingness to take people in, it was natural for them to say, come in. In those days, they couldn't work or even go outside, as they risked being checked all the time. My parents had a flat with one and a half rooms for the five persons of our family at that time. But they then hid the two Jewish women in the half room, where they had to go barefoot the whole time. They couldn't move. Whenever the bell rang, they had to keep absolutely quiet. Our own family of five lived in the larger room. Once there was a very dangerous situation. In an apartment house like the one we lived in, you certainly couldn't avoid having other people notice that there were additional people living there. So the block warden came to my parents' apartment, rang the doorbell and said he heard that my parents were hiding Jews. My mother said, can you imagine that in an apartment with just one and a half rooms? But please come in and have a look for yourself. And so he came into the entrance hall stopped and said, a room and a half, that's impossible. 
and he left. And that saved my parents and all of our lives. I don't believe my parents were actually afraid. They just trusted that nothing would happen to them, as they were very religious people. They believed they just had to help, no matter how dangerous it was. The Althoff Circus performs all over Germany. Today, for instance, in Karlsruhe. But in March 1941, it was performing in Darmstadt. Adolf Althoff was then the director of the circus. He remembers being approached one night by a young woman, Irene Danner. That was many, many years ago. I remember she came to the performance and we started talking. And she said that she would like to stay with our circus. I said, by coincidence, I had a job for her. I had an elephant act with three elephants and three ladies. There was my wife and another girl, and I asked Irene to join them. So she joined the show. And then she asked me whether her mother and her sister could also join. And she told me the reason. I had to help them. I couldn't leave them to the Nazis. To be honest, I have no idea how I could have done this. But I was glad to have done it. People in the circus knew my opinion. And they knew I was the boss. They knew they would be fired if they talked about what I had done. There was no discussion. Someone asked what the Jews were doing in our circus. I replied that I would get rid of them soon. And you know what I did instead? I threw that guy out. Somehow I found a reason. I said, you are dismissed without notice. Get out of this place right now. That was the only way. Under Mr. Althoff's protection, Irene, her sister and her mother survived the war, touring Germany as performers in the Althoff Circus. Irene has remained a close friend and a frequent visitor. <laughs> 